Okay, hello, uh, my name is uh, Rob Hordijk. I'm uh, from the Netherlands, uh, hence uh, the slightly strange sound in my name, I, uh, which is a typical Dutch thing. Uh, I'm a synthesizer, designer and builder, and uh, this is uh, one of the things that I, uh, I built and I will present to you today. It is a, uh, what they call a modular synthesizer, but it is a bit different than most of the stuff that you see here. And the reason for that is uh, quite simple. I like to uh, build complete instruments for musicians and composers. And uh, yeah, I was just thinking while smoking a cigarette upstairs, there is of course some, some philosophical, philosophical debate possible about uh, instruments and modular synthesizers. Maybe a modular synthesizer should be just a large toolbox of tools that can change constantly. Maybe that's a good idea in the studio, but I'm more of the side of people that think, well, it can actually be an instrument. Because if you think about the definition of modular synthesizers, there is a couple of things, well, maybe that are quite debatable, uh, but in an interesting way. Um, Actually, for me, a modular synthesizer is not about modules, but it is about modulations. Because if you compare a modular synthesizer to other types of synthesizers, one of the main differences is, and one of the big assets of a modular synthesizer, is that you can modulate everything with everything, because you can connect everything with everything. But if you have like a keyboard synthesizer like uh, Minimoog, then already everything is patched up and you're quite limited in sort of modulations that you can apply, but you can play it with a keyboard and do all your Stevie Wonder bass lines with it, so there's nothing wrong with the Minimoog. But modular synthesizers is just a different thing. Yesterday I uh, did a small, uh, slightly improvised performance. I'm not a uh, performing artist, I'm a synthesizer builder, uh, but that was sort of very abstract and I thought hey, maybe today it's interesting to do something completely different and uh, have a look a bit at uh, sequencing and uh, it's one of my guilty pleasures, sequencing, because one of the interesting things about sequencing is that sequencers by itself are mostly pretty boring machines. They do to 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 up to eternity, and then the question is, how can I live live in this up, spice it up, make it interesting, do it in a way that in the end I feel like, oh yeah, I really want to dance to this. That's of course the thing. I already set up a little patch just to. The interesting thing about this little patch is that it's just a simple one note sequence, uh, uh, three note sequence, so only with three notes you already see that you can make it quite variations. It's, uh, this is the sequence and I can also change that sequence into something else and together it can become interesting. But uh, one of the things that I always like to do is when I've set up a nice patch then other people say, wow, that's a great patch, is to just simply pull out all the cables, rip it up and that gives us the possibility to step by step set it up again. But I will also introduce you a little bit to this system. I know some people almost get heart attacks when they see me do this. <laughs> okay, first of all, uh, there is a, uh, a certain setup of this uh, system. You see that I work with rather large panels because I like panels that have some sort of a musical function. Like this panel is sort of like a complete voice. This panel is also sort of like a complete voice, but a different kind of voice. So what we have, we have an oscillator, we have an envelope generator, we have a filter with VCA, 
well, that's more or less already like a synthesizer. Um, the interesting thing is that if you make these panels different, that you always can work in a way that you have like two voices that play together, and uh, that can be uh, quite interesting in your sequencing. The, uh, this oscillator is uh, interesting. It's uh, my own invention. Basically, uh, you have a, uh, a sine wave. That's where you started from. But you can actually simply smoothly morph towards a sawtooth wave or towards a square wave. get a uh, sort of PWM kind of sound. That means that basically if you take a triangle and you, because this is voltage controlled, it's modulatable, then like you get a new kind of effect and that is brightness of the sound. And, uh, the reason why it is actually interesting to set sort of like the basic brightness of a sound is that if you uh, use this instrument in a mix with other instruments and with acoustic instruments and with vocals, then in general um, uh, oscillators tend to have a lot of energy in the very high region of the audio spectre. But in a mix, the very high regions of the audio spectre are solely for the voices and the acoustic instruments. Because there is very fine stuff happening there. Uh, many student, uh, guys call it the air, the breathing, the and if you have uh, too much high coming from like a synthesizer in that same area, you basically destroy the vocals and, the, and the, the subtleties in the acoustic instruments. So basically, the nice thing about this system is that if you use it in a mix, you can actually sort of set it exactly to the point where these two in, are in the perfect balance. So that is the original idea behind having this sort of idea that you can also set the brightness of the sound, but of course you can use it for many more things. Now traditionally also uh, in the original concept of, mo of synthesizers and modular synthesizers, the idea was that as sound consists of pitch, of amplitude and of timbre, to sort of separate these in three different boxes and each box would only control one of these aspects. So the oscillator would do the pitch, the envelope generator together with the VCA would do the amplitude, and a filter would do the timbre. But if you really think about it, an oscillator by itself already has a amplitude, must have, because it has no, if it has no amplitude, then you couldn't hear it, it would be silent. And the wave shapes from the oscillator also already have a timbre. So, it's not really such a strange idea to design something where at the oscillator level you can already also set the timbre, the basic timbre, in a way that maybe you don't get in a problem later in the mix with acoustic instruments or something, but also the amplitude. So this uh, oscillator also has a VCA built in at the oscillator output level and one of the most obvious uses for that is to actually use that with the, like the velocity of a MIDI keyboard because then later maybe you may be using wave shaping and if you use wave shaping that is mostly dependent on the level of the sound, the higher the level, the more distortion or something. So you can actually already set that at the oscillator level, control that at the oscillator level for later. Uh, it is uh, normalized uh, to a filter, and uh, this filter is basically a 
by a standard uh, 24 dB 4 pole filter. But um, if you Google on the internet to something that, say, that is called G2 Pages, you will find a text of some 12, 15 years old that I wrote then on the internet and there I explain how filters work and how multiple filters work and how you can create different curves uh, with a four pole filter not only by taking mixing the outputs of the poles but also by actually mixing signals to the separate input of the, po of the poles and in this case this filter actually has uh, three inputs uh, basically they're normalized so now I can listen to high pass, uh, uh, the low pass, the high pass, or band pass. But because these are um, on basically on the inputs to the poles of the filter, it means that I can also add another signal, for instance uh, from another oscillator, uh, let's take this one, and let's uh, feed this into the high pass input. You see? Oh, yeah. Notice that the high only fades in if I open the filter completely, and uh, so you can also sort of use it like a sort of a mixer. The idea is that you can take the hi hats from one drum computer and the bass kick from another drum computer. That kind of idea. Oh, sorry again. So. There is a built-in VCA because that is just very convenient uh, to have a VCA after uh, the filter, uh, traditional standard setup. Uh, actually, I will use a crossfader module here, which makes it easier for me. So basically, if I uh, just want a, uh, a very simple voice, I can just connect it to the VCA out. I have to open the oscillator output level, I have to open one of the filters, open the filter a bit, take a CV signal, one volt octave, take a gate signal, start the sequencer and then we should have a sound, maybe it's the cable. I can do several things. I can play with the filters, make use different curves. simply close it here. Um, I have normalized a couple of things um, because this envelope generator, uh, that is actually an interesting one. Uh, if you design uh, these modules uh, and you want to design all the modules for a synthesizer, then uh, you very soon find out that basically one of the most complex modules to design is an envelope generator. Oscillators really simple. VCAs, really simple. Filters, really simple. But an envelope generator is not really that simple because an envelope generator has to react in different ways to different specific states. 
So uh, you have an, a gate input that sort of starts it, but that gate will start an attack. And the first uh, decision you have to make is, now if this gate input goes low again, and the attack is still going, is only halfway, should I go to the next phase, to a decay phase, or should I continue the attack until it reaches its top value? Now, that is actually an issue, because if you do sequencing, uh, some sequencers uh, give you the control to set the gate length. But there's only very few that do, do that, and it's only recently that, that sequencer builders actually have become aware that this is a very important thing. Uh, but, there are, but for instance, if you receive triggers from a drum computer, mostly those triggers are really short. That means that if you give it a really short gate, the attack does not have the time to come up to level and you hear almost no volume. In that case, it would be interesting to have an attack that at least goes up to the maximum volume before it goes into another phase. And I have made a switch for this because mostly for sequencing, it is, a, it is an interesting idea to do that. So to demonstrate this a bit, uh, I will give it a very short gate time. Standard, it would be a bit like this. I am now making my attack time longer, but because the gate is so short, you hear it doesn't work. But I have a switch where I can actually force it to continue. Now it goes up to full. But now an inter interesting thing happens because now when the attack is actually longer than the whole node, it starts to skip. Actually, you can hear that that is something that maybe is interesting to use for a special effect. And silent, if it's too short. So, to have uh, control over the uh, gate length is, uh, is very important because uh, if you uh, analyze what, uh, for instance, like a bass player is doing when he wants uh, to uh, create a bit of a swing feel or a funk feel is that actually musicians they play with the length of the notes and it's the length of the notes the varying in the length of the notes that give that sense of swing and uh, in uh, in a sequence so if you have a sequencer that where you can do that just gives a 50 percent gate and that's it or always a 60 percent gate it is a bit boring uh, so I've explicitly uh, brought this uh, little SQ1 because it's a dirt cheap sequencer, but it is it, it actually is not such a bad one because you, you have this uh, knob here where you can actually set the length of the gate up to the moment that there's no gate at all. And, and additionally, you can uh, also modulate this gate time uh, by uh, assigning it to, a, to another sequencer. Now, that is almost what you want, because you want to create a pattern where the gate lengths uh, are different, just to get into a certain groove, but you want something additional. You also want to slightly modulate this, maybe by 5% with a random variation, because if you do that, which regrettably I cannot do on this one, but at home I use one of these coma complex sequences where you actually can do that, uh, then you get the, the human feel instantly. It makes an enormous amount of difference. Just 5% of random modulation on gate length is a tip for you. Experiment with it. Okay. Uh, now, if you only have fixed gate length, you have to, you have to uh, come up with other tricks. And uh, another good trick is uh, uh, if I just play this sequence, I can I can play with a decay. And 
you hear. That already also gives you an interesting variation. And uh, of course you want to, uh, now this, you see that I, that this system has really nice knobs that you can very easily uh, turn so you can actually play the knobs, which I think is uh, quite <coughs> important. That's also the reason why you have this size, so you have the room for your fingers to sort of play everything. Uh, but uh, you can uh, also modulate all these parameters by voltage control. But if you do that, then uh, you will uh, quickly notice that uh, if, I, uh, if I have this, uh, this sequence and I take a um, very slow LFO and I start to modulate the release time, now you'll hear the effect. But now I start to speed up my LFO And it doesn't really work anymore the way that it's not really that good. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, if you have a, uh, basically what you do when you modulate delay times is you do frequency modulation. Uh, because you do time modulation, which is basically frequency modulation. And there is a very simple rule for frequency modulation that you have to keep in mind, and that is that if you have a very high pitch that you modulate with a low pitch, then you get a lot of effect. But if you have a very low pitch that you modulate with a high pitch, there's almost no effect at all. I can actually demonstrate that to you. I will demonstrate it. Uh, then I will first close the mixer before we get a big bang. Uh, we can listen to a simple sine wave. Uh, let's stop this one. Now I have control over the thing. I take a uh, very uh, slow sine wave to modulate it. You hear a lot of effects, but now I slow this one down. And well, you hear a bit of an effect, but it's much less in effect actually than now when you go back to the envelope generator and modulating the envelope generated times, then you're in a really bad luck position because envelopes are actually very low frequency signals. And that means that you need to modulate them with an even much slower LFO to get a reasonable effect. So uh, then the question is, how can you fix this? And the way to fix it is very simple. You add a sample and hold. And first you route the modulation signal through a sample and hold and set the sample and hold signal. Use that to modulate the, for instance, the decay times. Uh, so, that's why a sample and hold is built in into the envelope generator. And I would now demonstrate the difference and you will immediately see that it makes quite a difference. Uh, let's see if I still have some... Again, the LFO straight into the release. sample and hold. That's much more effect. It 
it's especially important in the point where, like, if you want to create some swing, you would like that LFO to be sort of like in a two to three or three to four relationship in pitch to your beat. And basically, that is already that area where normal frequency modulation is not that apparent anymore. But if you use it, route it through the sample and hold. of uh, filter modulation added. And you apply the same sample and hold output signal also to the modulation envelope. Then in your thing because if I just pull this signal out it's a static one and then it depends on what you can do the interesting thing about this uh, system is that we have instead of a uh, the so-called multiples I uh, made what I call a, uh, a matrix an active matrix and an active matrix is a little bit like a uh, like multiples, but it does more. And I have to explain it a bit because it is actually sort of like uh, uh, the nerve center of the system. I myself I grew up with Sintis and Putnis that are matrix synthesizers, so I'm very familiar with the idea of matrices. But you have to realize that a matrix is basically a system where at one spot you can connect any output to any input. Uh, only uh, because this system has lots of outputs and lots of inputs, if you would have a full matrix, then that would be very big. So basically what I did, I made a smaller matrix where you have input jacks and output mix jacks and cross points. And you can basically define what you want as inputs and outputs. By default, the inputs to the matrix are actually the MIDI CV signals that come from the MIDI interface. So we have note, we have pitch bend, we have velocity, we have gate, we have volume, we have aftertouch. And the MIDI modulation wheel is actually normalized to two VCAs that are here. Uh, the way this works is, is very simple, and everybody who is uh, familiar with uh, large uh, uh, studio uh, mixing desks uh, and the idea of insert connectors on mixing desks uh, should be able to understand it immediately because basically all these cross points here are insert connectors that work similar as the insert connectors on a mixing desk. Only on a, a mixing desk you have one insert connector on every strip, or sometimes two, and here the inserts are basically arranged as a matrix. What that means that is that if I take a uh, signal, let's say an oscillator signal, and I put that into an input, then I can actually, then the, um, these are stereo connectors, the top is mono, and this is also mono. The inputs are mono. That means that the signal that comes into this mono input first goes through a buffer amplifier, and uh, these are precision buffer amplifiers that can be trimmed to perfection. Then the signal becomes available on the tip of the stereo connector. So if I take a mono cable and I feed it in here, then we should hear our sound. 
the rings of the connectors in a column are fed to six input mixers that feed their output to here. And basically that means that if I connect my signal here, I could now take a jack plug where the tip and the ring are connected to each other and then I can make a connection in a similar way as you would do that on like a Sinti or a Putney. Actually, if I take a... Uh, uh, now I had one... I, for I, I, I forgot to bring these cables, so uh, Phil set me up with... Uh, ah, it's a mess here. People I just have to organize, get organized, because this, is, uh, this doesn't work that way. I must have one stereo jack. <laughs> I only have one, <laughs> but normally, uh, if you if you get a system, you get six of these cables. So if I connect the stereo cable here, you hear nothing. But if I now, with my fingers, make a short circuit between the two. Uh, first try it. <laughs> yeah. You basically hear that if you uh, if you set like a resistor between the tip and the ring, could be a pot, could be a light resistor, a foot pedal or whatever, you can actually control how much signal that comes in will be added to this output. And because this works in a column, you can actually mix six signals in this column. You can also mix six, six signals here and six here and six here, so basically you have four six input mixers. But not only that, it also works as a multiple because you can also take these signals out. So in itself, it's a very flexible system because you can actually choose, oh, I put in one, si one signal here. I can route this signal to two other locations, mix it to an output, maybe even feed that output back into another input and be able to make very complex feedback uh, things. And it looks so simple. <laughs> It's quite interesting because everybody, uh, I don't make a lot of these systems. I, I, I just built one a month and uh, it's all on order. And, uh, but uh, the, the, the people that get them then in the first two or three weeks, they are playing with this matrix and they're like mind boggling. And then suddenly they, they, they understand it. And then I see posts half a year later in some forum like, I don't know how I could ever live without such a thing. Why doesn't every synthesizer have such a thing? So, uh, but it's, uh, it, is, it is not specifically my invention. It's, it's the principle of a matrix. A matrix allows you to connect everything to everything, to insert and get stuff out. <coughs> and it's just how you organize a matrix, uh, how, it, how it appears. But, I found out that this 6x4, six, six input by 4 output plus all the multiples in a system of this size and this amount of modules is sort of like the good balance. Uh, it's never too small for me, but most of the time I use most of it. So one of the things that we can do is, uh, for instance, uh, make a couple of devices that also have a stereo connector, where one, where the tip is basically an input and the ring is an output. Uh, so I can put this cable here, and for instance, I have a VCA. I will close it. VCA. Open the sound and actually close it in the middle because this is a bipolar VCA. It can not only multiply by a positive value, also by a negative value. So basically it's a little bit like a ring modulator. So I can open it in two directions. If I open it in the left direction, it actually reverses the waveform. So, and this is interesting because 
being able to multiply or um, uh, amplify with both a negative and a positive value means that actually you have a ring modulator. So I can modulate this VCA by giving it a uh, signal here. And let's say that I give it a sort of a sine wave kind of signal. Now if I open the modulation amount, set it to silence or this is also uh, quite interesting because if I don't modulate it with a uh, like sine wave or a triangle wave but I give it a um, an, uh, an envelope signal and I make the envelope a bit shorter then if I turn to the right Hear a bit of signal, but now I turn it to the left. Eh? Is there an echo? Is there an echo? <laughs> the reason why that happens is because I now basically sync my envelope a little bit through silence and a soft sound that is in inverse phase is heard after the envelope. And our mind thinks, oh, it's an inverse phase. It must come from another direction. So this is a total uh, psychoacoustic effect that happens in our head. It doesn't really happen here. It happens in our head. But it's, uh, I like it very much. It's fun. I call it uh, the poor man's delay. <laughs> So, basically, with this thing, I can do a lot of tricks. Uh, I have a couple of these uh, special, uh, what I call, node processors, because these cross points are often called nodes in a matrix. Uh, node processors, we have a, uh, a quantizer that can do uh, uh, several scales. Uh, we have a, um, a gain control that can give you a boost of 20 dB if you want to uh, insert an external signal and get it up to synth level. Uh, we have a offset voltage that can give a voltage offset to a signal and we have two of these uh, bipolar VCAs. And these bipolar VCAs are also, uh, they are DC coupled, so you can use them for um, uh, LFO signals as well, not only for audio. And that's why it's nice to have this sort of volume knob here because with this you can actually set the, 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 the moment of silence uh, by hand which is important if you have DC coupled signals especially if they're low but that can also give you interesting effects uh, uh, that is if I Connect an envelope, of course. Okay. Uh, I'm very good in walking into all sorts of side paths that I'm not supposed to walk in uh, during a demonstration. So I have now to get back to my original idea, and that is we have to see what we can do with this, with the sequence. Well, already we have our poor man's delay on our small sequence. But uh, one of the interesting, and we can modulate the, the K times and the tech times on the envelope generator to give it a bit more swing. But it's also interesting to think about how can you sort of change a very simple sequence 
into another sequence and have control over that sequence. Um, we can also do that. And one of the things that I like to use for that is, is, uh, is to use a wave shaper. I have a, um, a wave shaper here, which is the sort of standard wave folding type of wave shaper. If you apply it to, uh, to audio, oops, shit, sorry uh, about this. Uh, if you apply it to audio, you have some, some controls to uh, uh, set uh, the, the sound. I will just uh, feed it a, uh, a sine wave. And uh, a simple sine wave. First, you can crossfade between uh, the sine wave and the shaped sound. You go through that FM type of wave shape sounds. You can also make it asymmetric, which is interesting because then you... Go an octave higher. You can basically define how much of the original sound, how much of the wave shape sound. You can give it a bit of overdrive. But myself, I mostly like to use these wave shapers to, uh, on, on, on sequencer patterns. Because if you use this on a sequencer pattern, it means that your three notes, I only have three notes now, will change into other notes. And it depends on the settings of the wave shaper on uh, how this will be. But with my wave shaper, I actually have a VCA in front of the wave shaper to uh, be able to modulate it. Uh, and this is uh, uh, audio coupled, so not DC coupled. So basically, I cannot use the uh, uh, step signal into the straight input, but I also have a straight input directly into the wave shaper that is DC coupled. And if I use that, I can actually change DC and also LFO signals. So to do so, I, uh, I just uh, insert my little sequence into one of the inputs of the wave shaper. Now, if I, uh, uh, of the matrix, and then I can use uh, an output here to the input of the wave shaper. I can listen to my oscillator. And then if I output the wave shaper into like a one volt octave input of the oscillator, then not really uh, that much that I can do. I can play a bit with the wave shaping parameters, but it doesn't really get me into that sort of like a one uh, volt octave perfect notes. But for that, of course, I can use a quantizer, because I have a quantizer. So the idea is that if I take this uh, output and feed it back into the matrix, use one of these stereo insert cables, put it in the quantizer, put it in a cross point, and then route, route it to the one volt octave input, then... It's not really yet useful, and the reason is because I have no input level control on the uh, on the on the uh, shaper module. But it's quite easy to get an input level control because what I can do is before I can feed it into the uh, shaper, I can actually use one of these bipolar VCAs 
to set the level. And for that I need another insert cable. And Phil was so nice to uh, <laughs> supply me some. <laughs> so basically that means that what I do is I take the sequencer input and the first thing I do is I set the level of that uh, sequencer input and uh, I do that with the VCA. So let's see if we already... You hear, you get different things. I can set it to another scale. So not really what I want, because now if I if I quickly change this knob and or modulate it with an LFO, uh, it changes too much constantly, and 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 the the, the quantizer is a real time quantizer; it's not clocked, so it doesn't give me proper notes. Uh, but for that, the solution is very simple, because one of the things that I can do is I can take uh, I can actually uh, take the uh, the output of the uh, uh, wave shaper, put that in the, into the input of the sample and hold, and that sample and hold is already clocked by my uh, uh, sequencer, so I can take the output and use the output of the sample and hold instead of the... Uh, so where am I going now? I, first I go into my VCA, that goes here, my VCA goes into the shaper, the shaper goes into the sample and hold, the sample and hold comes back and the sample and hold has to go to the quantizer. Apparently the wave shaper sort of pushes the pitches in a somewhat bass region to the original sequence is a bit higher. So uh, one other thing that I can do is I have this offset voltage. So if I now add a bit of offset voltage um, before I go into the um, uh, sample and hold, but after the wave shaper, I should actually be able to sort of transpose my whole changed thing up and down. So uh, that means that after the wave shaper, but before the sample and hold, so that means that I have to route the output of the wave shaper into the matrix, use another cable, uh, let's say this row, put it into the uh, offset, and then use the top output uh, to go into the sample and hold. nice is because I am routing this through one of these bipolar VCAs, which I can modulate with an LFO, I can just take a very slow triangle wave, put that into the modulation input of that VCA. thing I have a sequence that modifies itself so uh, if I now sort of uh, use a, uh, a crossfader and I route 
the output of this first voice to the input of the crossfader. I take the gate into the gate here and I let the other voice play the original sequence. super small three-step work SQ1 sequence I already have created something that people think oh that you must have a very very complex sequencer to do such a thing but it's basically a nice and interesting trick that you can do with a wave shaper you have to do some other stuff as well think about the order a little bit then basically you can start to apply all these things that make it swing like gate length modulation uh, uh, release time modulation, uh, filter sweep time modulation, and uh, that can sort of change your very simple sequence into something that is much more lively and with a little, little bit of luck, at the end, will everybody <laughs> make a practice <laughs> all by themselves? <laughs> I think I should uh, leave it with this. Excellent. All right.